Hello, everyone. I hope everyone can see me and hear me now. Welcome to our CFPR lunchtime seminar. Just to warn you, I've been thrown out of Remo myself a couple of times just now. Hopefully, this won't happen again. But I would like to um, welcome everyone to the seminar. Um, this is our first um, uh, seminar that we're holding at the Center for Fine Print Research New Home in French at W block so um this is a, a new one for us and that's maybe why we're having a few connections issues i uh, hope everyone can has uh, joined us can hear and see uh, there is a chat function uh, in the remo platform so please uh, use that on the so yeah so i was talking about the chat function we have a chat function um, that we that where you i'd like i'd ask you to put your questions or and um comments uh, for our to, for today's talk that elizabetta is going around uh, talking to us about photographic conversation conservation so i'd like to invite um elizabetta to the floor to the stage so that we can um, have the have a presentation and hear about everything she's, she's um, doing. So, Elisabetta, can you please come and join us? Yes. Um, my experience as a conservator didn't actually start with photography. I studied um, conservation of objects in museums and archaeology at Cardiff University, where most of the objects encountered were Roman artifacts, such as the bowl seen in the image. And the teaching was mainly um, concerned with uh, material analyses. Uh, so there's a wide, wide range of materials, uh, and you can get a feel for what kind of materials you actually enjoyed working with. And here is where I first discovered um, my passion for photographs. Uh, I didn't actually know what this thing was when I first saw it. Um, turns out, after some diligent research, that it was an image of the Welsh Rifles, and it was on a dry plate glass plate negative. Um, it didn't actually need a lot of physical conservation, but the research done for it made me think that this is something I really want to work with, photographs and their meaning and the materials that it's made from. So after finishing the conservation degree, I studied an MA in History of Art, and then shortly afterwards, I became a trainee photographic conservator at Historic England. Now, at the time of my employment, um, I was specifically charged with the um, Breaking New Ground project, uh, which was mainly involved with digitizing and conserving the John Lang photographic collection. Now, John Lang was a construction company that um, built quite a lot of monuments like Carlisle Cathedral, um, which can be seen also in this image. Uh, the collection itself consisted mainly of uh, negatives and had approximately 230,000 images to digitise and therefore is quite a hefty job with lots of prioritisation. Most of the art items looked like this. So black and white film-based negatives, um, that just needed general assessment, rehousing, cleaning, and sometimes also um, interventive conservation. The housing most often was quite old archival paper material, which nowadays does not stand up to, uh, to proper, uh, proper conservation because um, even in archival environments, it can leave um, a quite unpleasant, uh, unpleasant uh, residue on the surface of the image. Uh, one of the interesting parts is when you assess an image is to figure out what is deterioration and what is actual intentional discoloration. I had no idea why this glass plate negative had purple spots on it on the corners, but with the help of my conservation supervisors and the digitizing team, uh, they explained that actually this is masking fluid that has been intentionally placed there by the photographer to improve the end, end resulting image. Um, here is how I would start working with um, glass plate negatives. So we, I would usually start with um, mechanical means, so seeing if I can actually do something with my hands uh, without using chemicals. In this case, the issue was that the uh, glass plates had um, red masking tape on them, which on its own is not an issue. However, the masking tape with age had become very, very sticky, which also wouldn't be a such a bad issue if it just attached itself to the packaging because the packaging would be replaced in any case. However, the main issue and danger was the fact that the uh, masking tape started attaching itself to other images and therefore all the place 
had become stuck together. And the real danger was if this, uh, this uh, masking tape started bleeding onto the emulsion surface, which then um, posed the issue of damaging the image and the gelatin emulsion. This is an example of what happened when I finally pried one of them free. Um, no real issues, thankfully, even though it was attached to the emulsion layer. Um, some paper residue, which can be easily taken off physically as well. But this is also a really good example of when to choose how far to go with your treatment. There are a lot of ethics involved with conservation work, especially when it's um, such a complex object as photographs, because photographs can be seen both as an image and an object consisting of various layers. So you would have to make this, the decision whether to save the whole object or whether to try and preserve the image itself. Uh, in this case, we decided not to uh, get rid of the masking tape, even though it is a little bit sticky, but we would make sure it is packaged correctly. Um, and to be fair, with a collection of 200,000 images, uh, trying to conduct um, individual uh, long-lasting treatments is not really feasible, so you have to make some compromises as well. Uh, here is a very common issue you would find in old archival packaging. Um, even in good conditions, sometimes the relative humidity can uh, change and therefore the gelatin emulsion can swell and become attached to housing. Now, this is still reversible. It just takes quite a lot of time um, and care to pry it away. Um, but this can happen in an archive and in your house as well if you have any uh, objects like this. Here is an example of uh, more of an indicatory um, deterioration rather than something that's actually dangerous. Now, when you have silver-based gelatin emulsions, uh, with time, the silver has a tendency um, to um, migrate the particles towards the top layer of the emulsion. And there you can see the um, kind of blue tint and shine that's called silver mirroring and will often appear in the darkest areas. Now, usually uh, this is not really treated because this just doesn't really affect the object. However, this is an indication that deterioration is definitely starting and that you need to be careful of where you keep the object. Here is an example of actual very bad deterioration towards the last stages of a lifespan of a photograph. Now, when the photographs were made, it was probably thought that they would last forever, you know, they were amazing objects, but in, in, um, in truth, photographs are very fragile materials that have a very limited lifespan um, and that cannot last forever. All we can do is try and ex uh, extend this lifespan and try and see what we, we can do to help. Now, in this case, um, you can see that what is happening is that channeling is occurring along with blistering on each side. Um, this is because um, there is off-gassing of material starting, uh, starting from the actual plastic layer. So this is causing these little channels. Um, we decided not to treat this individually because it can technically be treated by lifting the emulsion and placing it onto a different surface. So you, in this case, you would preserve the image itself and not the whole object. However, this takes a lot of resources, a lot of time, meticulous health and safety because a lot of chemicals will be involved. And there's the um, danger that the actual treatment is quite difficult and may not end up with perfect results. So we ended up digitizing these items as they are. Uh, they would look something like this. Um, and you would try to create uh, a positive from these digitally. And it doesn't actually look that bad. The image is distorted, but it almost looks like it's sort of underwater. So we decided that this will be good enough because you can still see what is happening in the image. I also encountered a couple of very interesting items that I had no idea what they were because they were very unusual. Now, this is a transparency that was very, very large. Uh, usually you can see these in about 35 millimeter formats. Um, however, this was encased in um, two plates of glass, one of which was broken. Um, so at first I actually mistook it for some kind of glass plate, not even negative, positive. Um, but after opening it up and checking the condition of the actual transparency, um, we found out from context that it was probably an enlarged transparency that was mainly for exhibition purposes and decided to leave it as it is because it, there is no sign of deterioration and it's perfectly visible. So we left it. Here is an interesting example of 
how you can find little clues about the material of your negative. So you will get different kinds of plastic bases for um, film negatives. On the left hand side, you have uh, a different kind of little indentations on the edge than from the uh, right hand side image. These are called notch codes, and these usually give away um, what is the material that the plastic is made out of. So the left hand side is an old material called cellulose nitrate, and the right hand side one um, with the half moon shape is cellulose acetate and a more modern image. Now, the importance to know these is because you would store them differently and there are differences in their deterioration. Cellulose nitrate, the old material, can be quite combustible and needs to be kept in very safe environments with very good ventilation. Um, otherwise, if you don't have these precautions, you might end up with your collection going up in flames, which is not something you would like. Here is an example of mid-level mid deterioration. So one of the first things that occurs is um, what we call planar distortion. So the, um, with, the with the change in deterioration, the um, plastic can shrink up to 10%. And while the plastic shrinks, the gelatin emulsion itself does not change at all. Um, so it starts wrinkling in this sort of strange fashion. Um, also a top tip, um, to find out whether your collection is starting to deteriorate, you can just smell it. If it's uh, cellulose acetate based, it'll often give out a sort of vinegary smell that is ca uh, called the vinegar syndrome. Here is an example of deterioration that um, cannot be reversed. Um, nothing can be done with this. Uh, the first image shows um, chemical damage that has most likely occurred during development. And the second one is um, a paper base for a print that has encountered a biological deterrent in the form of pests trying to eat it. And here are some original packagings that we found in our collection that um, are in desperate need of rehousing. The first one is not really too bad because it only contains a couple of large glass plates that you can carefully handle um, during movement and during uh, examination. However, on the right hand side, the packaging is really rather dangerous. First off, because glass plate negatives have been stacked on top of one each other in larger bounds causing quite a lot, a lot of weight, and this can result in them, again, getting stuck with each other to the packaging, causing a lot of issues in general, and also the fact that not no, the whole plate is not covered, and this just causes the very simple issue of they can break, and then you have a lot more issue of just cutting yourself as well. Here are some examples of um, slides you can find in their regular, probably very often seen, uh, plastic packaging. And you get actually two kinds of uh, packaging. So you get the classic um, uh, plastic film uh, slide packaging and you get um, heat sealed paper packaging that will definitely need changing and that can simply just be pried open. This is my chaotic workspace where I would rehouse most of these things with the help of specific um, uh, apparatuses to help make sure that the new packaging is safely um, put together, clipped together, so nothing accidentally falls out. The first thing that was, and probably the only thing that these actually needed doing was dry cleaning. Now this often happened with cotton swabs, which are used in conservation in general, everywhere, reusable cotton swabs, whether it's dry cleaning or whether it is um, uh, solvent cleaning, cotton swabs are like the holy grail. Another example of something that is kept together that shouldn't really be kept together are um, small negatives kept together with their contact prints in very old archival paper. Now the paper negative, uh, the, uh, the negatives themselves were fairly simple to deal with. They were cleaned and rehoused. However, it was, um, it was the, um, uh, the contact prints themselves that caused issues because these were attached to the paper housing with animal glue. In most cases, these could be detached with the spatula you can see in the image, but sometimes the glue was a little bit too stubborn, so what you needed to do um, was to somehow soften it. So there were two options for this. One was to float the uh, parts of the packaging that were attached on top of water very gently for a small amount of time, making sure that the images themselves do not uh, come in contact with water because they are still gelatin based and they will swell if in contact with water. 
And when this happens, um, you would then take them out, peel them off fairly easily because the um, animal glue starts softening and therefore is fairly easy to handle. You peel them off, you dry them off, and then you package them uh, usually in these uh, mylar uh, plastic little pockets. Uh, here is the second option of how to treat these. Uh, you can take each individual uh, packaging with the uh, image attached to it and use something called the preservation pencil, which um, uses a controlled um, ste uh, water steam with controlled temperature of it as well to slowly and very uh, in a very controlled way moisten and soften the back of the image and in that way soften the glue. However, this was used a lot more um, a lot more sparingly uh, for more delicate objects as it took a lot more time and if you have about 70 items in a box um, you can't really spare the, uh, the time to spend about 20 minutes to half an hour with just each individual item. So once all this was done these were packaged separately in archival packaging which looks like this and sent off to be digitized. And here is an interesting way of how to determine what kind of material you have if you do not recognize the, no the notch code. Usually the notch code is very helpful to t uh, tell you what kind of uh, plastic base you have for your photograph. However, sometimes um, there is no, uh, no written down documentation for it. So what you can do instead is use polarization. If you take uh, two sort of pol uh, polarization glass, uh, pieces of glass, put one of them under your image and then view the, uh, view the photograph with a second one, um, you can actually see if there is um, if there are diffraction waves for forming. Like in this example, there are diffraction waves forming, and that means that this is a polyester-based um, uh, color negative, which is a lot more modern than you you would uh, see in the collection. Um, however, if it did not show these kind of colorful um, wrinkles, that would mean that it is probably an older kind of uh, plastic use, so most likely cellulose acetate, um, and that will determine also what are the risks of the item, how they need, sto uh, uh, what kind of storage they need, and so on. I also encountered a lots of different kind of um, photographic processes that weren't necessarily um, meant for digitization, but were more for teaching purposes. For example, um, photolithographies occasionally came up. Um, this was especially uh, very confusing because it first uh, first appeared like a negative, but under some examination under, uh, under a microscope, you can actually see the classical dot pattern that creates um, this distinction. Then there were quite a few uh, carbon prints, which actually look quite a lot like uh, very large Woodbury types, but it's the size and the fact that uh, there are uh, quite large um, ink particle sizes when you look under the magnification that you can determine. And there are platina types, which are a lot rarer in the collection, but also a good example to see. My favourite, of course, was uh, probably the rarest object in the whole archive, which uh, was an autochrome. Now, autochromes were uh, quite interesting because they were made with potato starch and dye, so you would, under magnification, see these globules of dyed starch and they would create these absolutely wonderful um, images. Um, so yeah, this is probably one of my favorites. And practice materials were also used very often. These were unaccessioned objects um, that did not need digitizing or conservation, but it was good to learn practical uh, skills with it. So this person, let's call him Mr. Mustache, um, was attached to its packaging because of the swelling of the gelatin. And it had also cracks probably of differentiation in humidity of wherever it's been stored. And this is the back of Mr. Mustache. So the first thing you would do is um, cut everything open and see how much you can manually remove without doing any damage. And secondly, um, that you would test whether any kind of ink on top of it is um, reactive to water. So we'd use uh, DNS water, put a droplet on there, blot it away with some blotting paper and see if there is um, any ink running. And if not, then you can move on to the second step, which is after just cleaning it with, you know, dry cleaning, brushes, swabs, you can actually wash it. Now, washing also needs to occur in deionized water and for fairly short amounts of times, so you can do it various times, uh, rinse it thoroughly, but this also helps to remove the packaging from the gelatin as the whole image will swell and the paper will relax and you will end up with um, a detached 
uh, and softened material, which you can then put on a light box and uh, assess the damage, see what needs, uh, needs done. With the paper housing and paper materials that have been detached, um, these, would, uh, these were most likely um, evened out with um, small tools to, uh, to see if there are any wrinkles, if any adhesion is necessary. Um, you would then dry them under pressure, most likely under a book binding press for several days at least, um, and then package them up. Uh, of course, uh, it was also very important to learn how to uh, package items for exhibitions. For example, my colleagues made facsimiles of paper prints that were meant to go for a conference, and I uh, helped with um, packing these and preparing them for exhibition. And uh, I was very curious about actual paper materials, um, such as paper prints. So we chose an another unaccessioned, unofficial object to practice on. Um, and this print, uh, is very uh, brown, you can see, because it is uh, very acidic. It has been on a cardboard backing board, which most likely caused the acidity in it. So the first thing we would do was uh, just assess the damage, dry clean it very gently with um, specific brushes, um, and then, again, wash it. Now, an interesting difference between uh, paper items such as prints and photographs is that with paper, you would usually handle them with bare hands without gloves to be able to determine uh, determine what is going on and you can feel the actual paper and how thin it is and what's going on with it. So washing it in deionized water makes sure, uh, actually um, makes it more uh, white and bright so you can actually see the water becoming brown and the acidity coming out of it and you would do this several times, rinse it out with deionized water and again put it under a book binding press to dry off so it doesn't uh, distort and you are done. And an important thing to assess with your photographic collections is to see whether it's actually safe to handle. Here is an example of um, a close-up of a dead mold on a photographic neg negative that's in the gelatin layer. Um, most likely uh, you will encounter dead molds, but still the danger is that um, if you handle these, mold spores can enter the air. And usually um, that means you have to definitely wear a, a special grade mask, you have to wear gloves, and the first thing you would do is you would get a um, conservation grade hoover and try to clean everything off manually and make sure all the uh, dust particles and um, mold particles are caught with this hoover, go through the whole collection um, to make sure that uh, every single piece is cleaned like this, and then you can safely handle them uh, without a danger of mold spores spreading. You can also do some creative things with packaging. This is a, a fairly simple re uh, repackaging project, which I decided to make a little bit more fun, like so. Um, so basically, this is just a proof that you need quite a lot of uh, creative thinking, even for the um, smallest, uh, smallest uh, projects. And this is the bait of my existence, um, sellotape. Some of you may have heard me you know, exclaim or see me frown when I see sellotape. This is because uh, when it ages and deteriorates, it becomes sort of yellow and brittle and leaves behind this um, kind of ye uh, yellow residue. Now, in this case of this object, it was fine because this is on a glass, um, glass side of the negative, which was uh, then cleaned off with um, a sparing amount of acetone. Uh, it would be more problematic if it would be on the emulsion side, which would have to um, be cleaned off most likely me mechanical means so that the gelatin emulsion would not be damaged. And here is an example of how uh, broken glass usually is treated in archives. So the glass plate negative uh, would be thoroughly cleaned and actually no adhesives would be used in these, these kind of places when there are nice big clean breaks. You would simply ensure that they are um, neatly put back together, um, placed on a new piece of glass, Put, on, uh, put in a sink mat, which is made from acid-free card, like so, so you essentially make like a frame for it. Put another piece of glass on top of it, making sure everything is perfectly clean. Um, tape around the edges with um, acid-free paper tape and package it up. And this is the ending result without the use of any adhesives. Now, when I finished my um, one year contract, I became fascinated with everything I saw related to photographs. Um, this is in fact um, a photograph uh, that my parents had of my grandfather and my father, and they did not let me do anything with it because they liked how old it looked. However, I thought I might use this opportunity to give a, a few uh, suggestions for your own items in your home um, and how to keep them safe. 
So first off, just keep them dry um, because the humidity will swell the gelatin and also attract um, mold. Make sure also they are out of the way of any pests and insects because these kind of items, especially paper-based paper -based prints, are great food for bugs. Uh, keep them away from bright light as they will um, fade, especially um, colour-based negatives. Um, this one's obvious, don't crease them because the um, creases will become, like in this photo, quite visible and unless um, you want to try your hand at painting them in, then it'll stay like that. Um, don't stack them because, again, if you stack too many heavy items, uh, you will get, um, with change of humidity and ra rainier days occurring, if you forget about them, they might eventually start sticking together and then you get, again, problems. Um, this is a little bit of a picky one. Uh, if you can, don't keep them in wooden drawers or at least old wooden drawers because uh, wooden uh, materials have a tendency to off-gas acidic vapour that can also impact the item. Now, this is a very picky one and usually it's fine. This is more like if you want a professional collection. Um, and the last one is uh, please, please, please do not wash these items yourselves, uh, mainly because um, sometimes you can't see damage that has been previously done to the structure of it by mould. Uh, so if they have been mouldy at some point, or if some cap the structure of these has been damaged, and you, if you try to put these in water thinking it's fine, it's fine, it'll, I'll just wash them, you can end up with a mushy mess that you cannot put back together. So um, even though these can be washed, it's best to avoid that on your own. Thank you for listening. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues at Historic England uh, Archives for helping me and teaching me. And uh, I also want to thank my colleagues at uh, CFPR. Are there any questions? Well, thank you very much, Elisabetta, for um, your talk and for an insight on how, uh, how a photo and a paper conservator work. Uh, I had a couple of questions, but uh, you've answered them well, because um, my main question was, was there any, any tips for people who collection maybe to uh, to look after and you know we all you, we all have collections probably from our parents or grandparents uh, you know of um, embarrassing or not so embarrassing pictures of us being being children uh, and all that so um, yes you answered them very well and I think the other thing that maybe I could add to this as well is to before if, if there are any damaged um, images that you want to sort of keep is to um, maybe digitize them before anything is done to them. Is that something that, that you used to do as well? Just to make a copy of what it looked like before, before you started doing something to the images? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the last line? It went a little bit crackly. Oh, sorry. Uh, did you, um, in your in the, in the conservation, conservation world, do you also sort of have a, take an image before, uh, you start any conservation work on the actual image, like digitally or in a different way? Um, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my, my sound is a bit weird. Could you write down a question and I'll answer it? Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> sorry. So at this point, can I also ask Neve to join us on the stage? Okay. Uh, to, uh, and I shall uh, shut up and I'll put it into the chat. And yeah, thank you. Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks so much for the talk. It was really fascinating to hear about your work and, and really um, very informative insight into the world of conservation. So I find this relationship between um, the kind of caretaking process and the revival of the artifacts really special. And I love that kind of investigative work um, or that kind of investigative nature in your work. Um, and you seem to develop this really um, intimate and attentive relationship to your materials. Um, and there seems to be a very strong uh, relationship to those materials as well. You mentioned uh, smell and touch as kind of key indicators to um, maybe the conservation process. And I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about using your senses and that kind of idea of the haptic. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's all very important to just determining what is happening and um, if there is a start to actual deterioration itself, because like I said, um, one of the first um, kind of indications that deterioration is happening is the smell, the vinegary smell. But when you look at it uh, from just 
a visual perspective, there is absolutely nothing happening to it. So it's very important to think about all the different kind of senses you, you can um, then use, like smell in, in contrast to the visual. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite different also depending on whether it's a negative and what kind of material it's based on, because e each mm -hmm. thing will have a different kind of smell um, depending on what kind of material it has. Um, and what, uh, you know, um, and it also helps with uh, determining um, what needs to be done if um, if it can help prevent um, fast deterioration. Like I said, you can only kind of slow it down. So if you start noticing something with one, uh, one sense, so if you notice that something is actually smelling a bit off, you start thinking, okay, do I need to rehouse it in some other packaging? Is it the housing that's wrong? Is it um, a drawer it's been put into? Um, and that really helps with the longev a longevity of your collection as well, I think. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. That's a great answer. Thank you. And, and I also noticed you, you speak a lot about the materials and um, kind of observation of the materials and how that might affect the decision making process of what gets conserved. Um, I guess um, I was just wondering about that decision making process. I noticed you didn't really mention the narratives that might be attached to the photographs, but is that a concern in terms of if something was deteriorating quite badly, but you knew, you know, there there was a, an important narrative attached to it? Um, would that influence how you work in any way? Uh, usually it would. Um, the issue with our project was the fact that we had a large amount of items and um, it's only only a few of them were selected. So we had an actual curator who would look through all these images and uh, see when they were taken, what was in the image and choose the ones to digitize. And then I would look at them and see what needs doing, if they need rehousing, conservation, or if they're fine. Um, and most of the time you would think about the importance of them and the relevance. However, sometimes you have to make these compromises about whether it's good enough, because like I mentioned, um, from a conservation perspective, um, a photograph is kind of like an object itself. It's not just the image. So you also have to think about what it is on, what kind of material it's on, um, how many layers there are. But from an archival perspective uh, and uh, you know this kind of narrative perspective, you want you want to see what's in the image, and so that kind of gives you the option of like whether you want to um, go for a more extensive um, treatment that might be potentially long expensive possibly dangerous because it's a very important image or whether you cho choose to say it's good enough we'll look, come back to it we'll flag it up as something that needs to be at least needs looking at and then just see what can be done with what it is what stage it is at now so for example the um channeled very wrinkled negatives that were at the last stages of deterioration they were very interesting images and there were quite a lot of them like that uh, however there were so many of them and the image itself was good enough to actually show the narrative that the decision was made that this should be a separate project to try and at least save them as much as you can okay wow that's really yeah that's really interesting and, and you mentioned as well so there's this kind of um there's this process of choosing what what gets shown to the public, and then obviously there's some things that are 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 kind of remain hidden uh, or or don't get chosen. So what happens to them? Like, do they just remain in the archive, or yeah, are they kind of engaged with in any way? Oh yeah, uh, the archive is a public institution, so you still have to um, well, first off, make sure that everything is safe. So uh, because uh, one of the things that happens is you get a lot of uh, guests coming in and actually uh, looking at these images, um, not just photographs, but the old maps and prints um, for research purposes. You know, it's, it could be, you know, locals who are looking for old references of their parents, or it could be research associates or, you know, PhD students who come in and want to look at these materials. Um, so it's really important to make sure that whilst you're not maybe doing in-depth conservation because they're not meant for like public exhibitions for promoting, you know, uh, collections and whatnot, but it is still extremely important to make sure that they are still safe, handleable, and you can ensure that uh, people coming in can actually look at them safely and you give instructions if there are issues of how to handle them correctly. So okay. it's still quite, uh, still quite um, well looked after. Brilliant. And I see we have some questions in the chat. So um, one of the questions is, do you take before and after pictures in case something goes wrong with the conservation process? 
I think that might be from Frank, but I'm not sure. Right, let me read that as well. Uh... Oh, I see that. So, uh, yes, we do take our uh, before and after photos. Definitely. That's one of the first things you do. <laughs> you have to make sure that you have a good quality camera. Um, if your phone has a good, good enough camera, that's fine. Uh, because, to be fair, a good phone camera can be very handy also to... Um, capture what happens in between so uh, the more photos the better and you write also everything down what you've done so if something does go wrong you can go back to these images and you go back you go back to these notes and you can see basically everything you've done you can backtrack and kind of try to figure out what was that went wrong uh, but yeah um it's very important to keep before and after images to compare yeah i am i imagine and angie has also asked a question she says hi elizabetha a lot of conservation jobs seem so fiddly when learning are you given support from others about how to control your hands breathing etc uh yeah you do get that yeah but also i suppose because um I actually studied conservation uh, in uni as an undergrad. There was quite a lot of practice involved. So it's it's like with any other kind of crafts thing where um, you just need a lot of hands-on practice for it because there is that scientific approach and, you know, the research about the history of the object, but you actually have to do something with it as well physically. So you kind of learn yourself how to deal uh, deal with these things. Uh, obviously, you do get your teachers giving you little uh, hints of like, okay, um, move your hands more carefully, wear right size gloves and that kind of thing. Um, they will show you examples of how they work, but then you kind of find your own flow of things and how you work best. So it's all about just building up confidence, really. Yeah, I imagine like, because handling film myself, it's so, it's so, flimsy and <laughs> just it can be really it can be really difficult and and also with glass plates and everything you want to be quite careful but, but that's that's really great thank you um so i wonder if if frank is coming back um or if we have any other questions for elizabetha before we end yes i'm back here so <laughs> i've uh... Thank you very much, Neve, and thank you very much, Elizabeth, for the for the talk and for leading the Q and A's. Uh, I'm sorry if the uh, people have had some some difficulty logging out today, but just to reassure everyone that the talk, Elizabeth's talk, and the question and answers have been recorded. I should have mentioned that before, but yeah, so the talk has been recorded, and we will put it onto. I will edit it together, and I will put it onto the CFPR CFPR website. So please, any everyone. Uh, can watch, re-watch all the other presentations that we've had as well. Um, just to, fi to finish now, I just wanted to say thank you again to Elisabetta and uh, a belated welcoming to the welcome to the center as well. And we will be um, making use of your um, of your skills and of your uh, uh, of your of the, all the knowledge that you bring to us as well. So thank you for that again. And just so final, if there's no more questions or uh, anything in the chat, we can go back out of the presentation in a minute just to say that uh, our next uh, seminar is on the 7th of July uh, as well. So uh, look out for the adverts for this. So thank you everyone for coming.